Now, the announcement said that we're going to be doing Colossians, but we've completed Colossians. So I th thought I would uh, stick with these short epistles of Paul and do Philippians. Now, I know I've done a little bit of this in the past, but it's, but it's a series. So we've done, what, we've, what we've done thus far is Ephesians and uh, Colossians. We're doing Philippians. Then probably I'll do Galatians next after that, you know, uh, something like that, and go from there. So I thought it would be good for us to just uh, open up with that. And uh, although I am tempted to, to show you something here. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a terrible man that way. I, gotta, I, ad, I admit this. I fully, ad, I fully admit this, you see. Because you see the psalm we're talking about, oh, give thanks to the Lord. I couldn't resist myself. You know I was going to do it. Um, this is a summary of psalm. They were wanderers, and they were retrieved. They were prisoners, the second scene, and now they're released. In the third scene, they're sick, and then God delivers them, and they are restored. In the fourth scene, they're storm-tossed, and then they are rescued. And so the, the oh, give thanks to the Lord for his good. Consider the loving kindness of the Lord. And we, we see as well is that we've kind of made that the flesh versus the spirit. And so the, God, the way God has delivered us. This is actually the content for a book I'm working on called Pilgrimage uh, in, the, of the, in the Psalms. And uh, it's, it's going to be a, a fun thing to do. And of course, we've done this together, if you might recall. This is the series we did here, and the, as a result of that, I'm going to be turning it into um, an interesting kind of a book with my um, artist friend, Stephen Krotz, and work our way through them. So that, that's, um, in fact, we just did some more projects. I'll show you what it's going to look like soon. Meanwhile, however, let us go and uh, consider this contrast here with Ephesians and also with uh, Colossians and Romans. This pattern that we see in these three epistles, where you have, of course, the left half gives us our position in Christ. And there are no commands, in, particularly in Ephesians, uh, the way it's structured. And insofar as this is something God has done for us, we cannot do it our, on our own. He's given us a new position. He has made us new beings, new people. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. And that's yet, on the other hand, the second half will now focus on the becoming or the doing. And we, as I like to put it, our call in this world is to become in our practice more and more who we already are in our position. So you are becoming. You're already perfect and stand righteous and holy and acceptable before God in your spirit, seated with him in the heavenly places. But in your practice, that's not in perfection. Sometimes we say or think or do things we don't want to say, think, and do. And so we live in that struggle of a world in which we are called to actually make this more and more the case, though, by walking by the Spirit and training ourselves to become more and more responsive. The other chart you remember we used when it was for Ephesians, and you recall, again, you have the left and the right, the wealth and the walk, and so, again, zero commandments, 35 to contrast the fact that the left is something only God can do, but now we have our human response ability. You have the ability to respond to God's overtures and initiatives. And so when you choose to walk in the power of the Spirit, as you trust the Father, abide in the Son, and walk by the Spirit, so as you are doing those things, you are actually now able to fulfill the requirements of the law, which, which are impossible of human fulfillment apart from the work of God, God then does that in you and through you. That's why we can either walk by the flesh or we can walk by the spirit. So these become the two major modalities there. And we recall that I put them on their side and, and put them this way to show you that the left side is really the foundation um, and the right side is really the superstructure. So by realizing that, these are the key things that we need to zoom in on and focus on, you see. And that interior life, that interior quality, the interior character, if that's in the right place, the outside takes care of itself, you see. So it's an inside-out process. So that's why you need to pursue intimacy with Christ and pursue him above all other goods. And then you find that it's far better to love Jesus than to try to avoid sin. You see, it's much better. When you're loving Jesus, you are avoiding sin. When you are trusting in the Father, when you're abiding in the Son, walking by the Spirit, you are now actually not, you don't have to try to avoid sin. 
because you are now in that sphere of the Spirit of God, so that now all that you think and say and do, insofar as you're Spirit-filled, is going to be honoring to God. And that's the foundation for the superstructure. So if you focus on the foundation, the superstructure takes care of itself. Yet, on the other side of that coin, there is a reciprocity. There's a respiration that goes on between being and doing. And you know that this is true, because attitudes can affect ad actions can't they? We know that that's for sure. You, and then at the same time, you take certain actions and it'll eventually affect your attitude. Belief affects behavior. Behavior affects belief. There, there's a reciprocal trade. And that's why I think that there's a kind of respiration so that every day you're supposed to be uh, walking in the spirit and in, in the being component, but then you're called in this day to serve other people, love people, and to do your work before God as a person of integrity and character. So being and doing, they do re reciprocally relate to one another. So that's just a way of looking at that. So to give you this a little bit of a perspective on Philippians here, I won't go into much detail, uh, but just a few details. Um, I have a visual presentation for each of the books of the Bible. This is a little tiny part of it. To live as Christ is a key phrase. It really is the concept. You, you want to live, it's Christ plus nothing. So this idea, it's not him and something. He himself is sufficient for all things. So Paul says to live as Christ, to die as gain, which is the, uh, those are the words of an overcomer. Because with that philosophy then, whether, as he said, I'm, whether I'm exonerated or executed, it's still the same. For me to live as Christ, to die as gain. You can, you're an overcomer. See, nothing can, can take that life away from you because you know who you are and whose you are. And so the key verse, again, Paul also says another text that people love and take great comfort in, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere. And in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through him who, who strengthens me, Paul says. And so, and then a key chapter, as we're going to see, of course, is the uh, humility of Christ is, um, becomes the exemplar for how we should have on the, put on ourselves the mind of Christ. And it's this idea we've seen multiple times that our Lord doesn't ask us to do something that he has not already first done for us. It's an amazing concept when you think about that. He's the one who has forgiven us, so then he asks us to forgive others. He is the one who has taught us, and we are to teach others. He's the one who served us, and you can just go down the line. Any, any mandate, he's already been the exemplar of that mandate. As to the, uh, this epistle, a short little epistle that's very warm, very informal. It's a letter of affection and love. He's very, I think Philippians may be his favorite church. No strict out outline in this one, as, as is more evident, though, in, let's say, Ephesians. But this devotion to the gospel becomes exceedingly evident in this. And some of the key words, rejoice or, re or joy, 16 times in this short little uh, four-chapter epistle. And really, remember those chapters didn't exist. It was, it was on pi papyrus. It was just a small papyrus scroll. And 16 times that word is used. But where is he writing it from? He's writing it from prison. So it's a prison epistle. And this is an important perspective, again, because it illustrates how one can have joy that transcends circumstances. As you know, happiness is circumstantially bound but joy transcends them. Who for the joy set before him, what did he do, Hebrews tells us, endured the cross. So that, the, that it is not a matter of happiness, it's a matter of holiness. It's a matter of choice and, and commitment, not a um, matter of, of just having circumstances go our way. Also, phroneo, this word attitude or think, to have them to think to think in this manner, and this, the mind of Christ is used. And then the, the gospel is a key theme in this epistle. So in, the, in this very powerful little word, you see a lot of things that are manifest, and especially about the person and power of Christ in such a short epistle. This is one of the most important texts about our Lord in all of Scripture because this passage about his kenosis, his emptying himself, as we'll see next time we're together, Humility is a vehicle to unity, and Christ is the ultimate, again, exemplar of that. 
We also see in this text about, learn about his pre-existence, his incarnation, his humiliation, and his exaltation, a great summary of that, and how we see him in portraits of Christ, that he, this kenosis passage then, and, and then we also see Christ as our life. And so he is our life. For me to live is Christ, and to see him then as our source of life. I had a lovely experience that reminds me just yesterday. Um, I, it's obvious I went to my dermatologist, as you can see from this mark here. You know, he removed a precancerous object, or I forget what the name of it is. There are all these, these seborrheic keratosis and various wonderful other products that we have. But um, I, so he's removed that and burned it, burned it off with the liquid uh, nitrogen, isn't it? Or, yeah, and so that's a lovely experience. Um, <laughs> and one time wasn't enough. Zap, he had to zap it a second time just to make sure it was nice and thorough. But I'm glad to get rid of it because, if, as you know, if you don't you, you ignore it, it's not going to get better. But the uh, when I was driving, uh, going up the elevator, there was um, an elderly woman who was very flustered and so forth because she felt she was apparently late for the appointment. As it turns out, she was going to go to my floor, and as it turns out, she went to the same doctor. And uh, it was fascinating just to talk with her and listen to her because I could tell that she was a believer just from some of the phrases she was using and so forth. And she wasn't whining; she was just concerned because she was 15 minutes late for her appointment. Um, then after I, uh, I'm, I'm through with my appointment, guess who I run into just as uh, the elevator opens? It's her again. And, and so we, it, the odds aren't, aren't that high. And uh, we went down together, and we had a nice chat there. And I realized she is a believer, and I told her that. And I felt prompted to give her a copy of uh, uh, Jesus in His Own Words, because I always carry a couple copies of that with me. And then we had just this little connection and uh, talked about various things together. And it was just one of those meaningful moments that was a nice connection. And she had prayed that someone would notice that she knew Jesus that day. So uh, don't you love it, though, these little appointments? If she wasn't late, I wouldn't have sound, found her, you see. But then it all works out because she himself, herself acknowledged that her being late then meant, meant that we had this appointment. So it always, there's always a reason for that. Right? That's why you don't have to wring your hands in despair. You have to let loose of your plans and receive his plan. Remember, your karanas and substitute that with his kairos. But that was an example of this, the idea of living in... So, I said, you're, you're a believer, aren't you? She says, she says, are you? She says, Jesus, you know Jesus? You know, because you want to be very specific. Yeah, the name above all names. I love that, though. Isn't it nice to just see those little moments that I think are planned for you in ways we can't understand, but you have to be open to them and receptive instead of steamrolling your agenda. As the big temptation we have is always our chronos ruling, dominating, leading us, and then our, our joy becomes based upon our, uh, our uh, plans and achieving of our plans, rather than our joy being based upon being alive to the Spirit and actually letting loose of my plans and receiving His, His, his Kronos, um, His Kairos. Christ is the model of humility. To let this mind, this attitude be, which was in Christ Jesus, and so these portraits are rich. He's the transformer, and he's the comforter of our lives. He's going to transform your body, your lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body. And I, I have become more anticipatory of that event. I don't know about you. The older I'm getting, um, I'm finding myself having a more of an aspiration for home than ever before, which makes me more earthly good, do more earthly good, not less. The more you're heavenly minded, the more you long for that, the more you treasure, you pressure, uh, you, you treasure the precious present for what it is. So we, I, but I live with that in mind more and more. And then he's the source of our power. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So in this text, then we see um, Paul's. I'm just going to point out just a few things here. The um, his standard greeting, but it's not just Paul. It's Paul and Timothy that he always saw himself in a ministry in tandem with other people. He was not a loner. And then to the saints, and we're called saints, um, holy ones, because that's our true position in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 
Um, and then grace to you and peace from God our Father. And then he thanks them in all my, his remembrance, always offering prayer with, with joy in my prayer, every prayer for you all. So there's a, that's the first use of the word, uh, this, this idea of, of his rejoicing uh, the, with joy. In view of your participation in the gospel, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus, which is for me a very comforting word that God's the one who started it, and he's, you're in for the full treatment, whether you like it or not. You may have come to Christ to get a better, more comfortable life. He's, you're in for the full treatment, though, and he's going to give you something. He's going to deal with your comfort and give you character. And so he's going to actually uh, discover that life is not so much about happiness, but about holiness. It's not about, not about uh, uh, our own ideas, but rather his character to become more conformed to him. And so this is a process that, of preparation, and because he loves us more than we love ourselves. We would ch choose a lesser good, he would cho choose a greater good. Um, every day, though, I argue with God about what my best interests look like, and so do you. It's just the nature of the beast. And so after a while, you train yourself to realize that you don't regret the works of God when, he, when we do what he calls us to do. So it's only right for me, because I have you in my heart. In my imprisonment, of course, he's referring, of course, to his uh, first Roman imprisonment. And in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you're all partakers of grace for me, with me. God's my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray that your love may abound. You may have seen this prayer before. You see, that? Are you familiar with this prayer? I hope some of you have learned it, you see. Um, real knowledge, and so it's a prayer, remember, for that real knowledge of God, not just head knowledge, but relational, personal, experiential knowledge and all discernment to approve the things that are excellent and to be sincere. And that, re that word sincere, sine sera, remember that? It means without wax, sine sera. And they, the, instead of putting wax in to cover up little cracks, and the sun would expose that if it melted, this, they would actually have a mark on the bottom of the pottery, sine sera, no wax here. What you see is what you get. So it's integrity. And so the more you walk in Christ, the more you become united. Unite your heart, my heart, to fear your name. Instead of being double-minded, you see, half-hearted and double-minded. So you want to play by one set of rules and walk with integrity in this world of darkness. And we walk with a sense of hope and purpose because we know who we serve and greater is he who is in you than he was in the world. We're in a spiritual warfare. We're all aware of it. But at the same time, though, he's given us the resources that we need to be more than overcomers. Having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through him to the glory and praise of God. Now he talks about how circumstances have turned out for the greater progress. Remember, Paul's gone through two years of Caesarean imprisonment, which was not on his agenda. So he was dealing with that. And finally, he realized that he was going to lose his life if he played their game. So ultimately, he had to appeal to Caesar. This meant then that he was carried away as a Roman citizen. He had that right. Otherwise, it's certain that the Jews would have killed him because they had a plot to do so. So two years after that, and then he has a yet another two years that he's in a Roman, uh, 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 under house arrest. So you wonder about the progress of the gospel, and it doesn't seem really a great thing. Here he's called to be a missionary to the, to the Gentiles, the apostle to the Gentiles, and now he's got two years in Caesarea Philippi and another two years. What's that about? Would you ever wonder? Have you ever had things like that you wonder about? Certainly you do. It makes no sense from a human point of view. But Paul's perspective is that God always redeems what he allows, and there's a reason why he's in there. And in this instance, he says, because it's actually become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard. It's the most effective way he could have actually entered into the city by as being a prisoner because of the connections that he has. Because um, that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have more, far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. And you have to realize that they, they, they were on shifts, and he would always be chained to a Roman soldier on shifts. And you know what he's going to be talking about, not the weather. He's going to be talking about Jesus, and one person after another would come to faith. 
And then he would build and teach and minister to them over two years. This became a laboratory, a place where he could actually receive guests and so forth. It was a very central thing for him to do. He said, but he does mention this. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. But he says there are some people, though, out of jealousy. They proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. But then look at Paul's perspective, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I will rejoice. Even if it's done with wrong intention, he rejoices that the message is conveyed because God can transcend the message, the messenger. And so he can use that. So his perspective, again, is that of one who sees God in control. Even though he's in imprisonment, um, yet he sees what God's doing things that he couldn't otherwise know. So he says, yes, I will rejoice. Again, you hear that imagery of rejoicing being repeated. He says, I know this is going to turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Christ Jesus. So according to my earnest expectation and hope, that I'm not going to be put to shame, but in everything with all boldness, he'll be even now exalted by life or by death. So he doesn't put fine print on the contract. It's either way he's, that Christ would be elevated. And that ultimately then, as he says, this is his perspective. To live is Christ, to die is gain. So if anything, then he's better off being with the Lord. Yet he knows that there's unfinished business. If I'm to live on in the flesh, as you see, he wrestles with this. This will mean fruitful labor. So he says, I don't know which to choose. You see, on the one hand, maybe there's unfinished business that he needs to take care of. And I, I realize I'm, I'm, I'm living on, 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 on time, borrowed time. I think we all are in some ways. We're living on borrowed time, aren't we? And we have unfinished, that means you have unfinished business. You see, he'll take you when, you when his purpose for you is complete. Uh, but right now, though, as long as you're alive, every day matters. And you're going to run into people and probably won't be in your calendar. And you need to watch for that because it'll be the Kairos invitations that God will use this very day, which can be either invested or it can be squandered, but you'll never get it back again. So Paul's perspective is that of an overcomer. He says, I'm hard pressed because I'd want to depart and be with Christ. That's very much better. So that's his desire. His true longing is to be at home with Jesus. And the more you think about home, you should be having a great, greater appetite for it yourself. Um, we get so enriched in this world because of these uh, goods that we have that are incredible in comparison with all former generations of men. You need to understand how unique it is. Your situation in this time and in this place is pretty amazing. And uh, it's not what, it, we're not in Camelot by any stretch, but I will say in comparison with the vast, vast number of people who have lived and even now live, you're living like kings in comparison. We're, we're wealthy men, and that's a, a perspective that, so that we are called then to realize that we should be grateful for that. And so the problem is, though, the more you comfortable you are in this world, the more you become tethered to it. And after a while, then, you, you really don't want to go and be with Christ because you after what, what about my children? What about my grandchildren? And then you're tethered to a, a, a lesser good. And then when you love your, that family more than you love Christ, then you're loving them less, actually, than if you loved Jesus more than them. It's an amazing idea, but it's true. So that if, indeed, you know that you're here for a season, and God will take care of it, but at the same time, you must love his appearance, love him, love, his, love home more and more so that you are actually uh, longing for home and world-weary and homesick. But he goes on to say, yet to remain on the flesh, he says, is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, he says, I know I will remain. So it's like he decided right there at that point. He says he's processing this. It's like the Spirit says, I am going to remain. And when he writes to Philemon at the same time, he says, prepare for me a lodging. So this is um, and, and, and a conclusion he reached. So that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. But then his reminder, just conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Whether I see you 
or not. I'm going to hear that you're standing firm. And this desire for a unity in their spirit is very critical. One spirit, one mind, striving together. Because unity is exceedingly important in a time of spiritual warfare. And so with one spirit, one mind, striving together, not against each other. I'm amazed how the church often kills its wounded. It's, it's, it's amazing how uh, the, the Christian church and when, when a ministry has problems or somebody, it's amazing how there's not a unity of spirit and a cons- an other-centered concern. Instead, of, uh, there are self-appointed fruit inspectors who rise to the occasion. And so what you need to do is to recognize, to have the unity of, and diversity because it's a watching world. And how will, they be, how will you be known? Not by your contention, but by your love. In, in spite of differences, you will continue to love one another. One spirit, one mind, striving together for this faith. In no way alarmed by your opponents. And he says this is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. And then he says, for you to, to you it's been granted. That's the word for uh, give, spiritual gifts. It's like a gift. You've been given this gift. Here's your gift. For Christ's sake, not just to believe, but to suffer for his sake. And, and that gift is, is, is the gift of intimacy because you're never going to know him without adversity. You can never grow in him without uh, following in his steps. In that sense, then it's needful for us to become like him. You must also, uh, as he told you, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be with me. And so this uh, concept of, of Philippians then in chapter 1 really reminds us to have an eternal perspective in this temporal arena. And so I love his attitude toward his circumstances and his appetite for home. His attitude is a Christ-centered attitude where he realizes nothing happens by accident in the purposes of God, and that God's plans will not be thwarted by human engineering and aspirations. So that his perspective on his circumstances, he sees them from a divine rather than a human perspective. Also, the appetite for home. And my prayer for you is that you would cultivate a growing appetite for that. And then third is the purpose of adversity. To realize that adversity is designed, in fact, to draw us into deeper intimacy with him. Because... He, that's why Paul says, says, uh, says elsewhere, I rejoice in tribulation, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance and proven character and proven character hope, and hope does not disappoint. So that he realizes that it has a purpose to bring me to forge your biblical hope, because you will not have biblical hope without adversity. So you have to hope in him, and he takes things away so that you learn to transfer your hope from the world to the thing that's going to be most needful, the one thing most needful, the pearl of great price. I'm going to leave this up during our time together so you can kind of process these major uh, events. All right, so these, you know my um, ap- appetite, my appetite for... Um, for this, the whole process of using the same word again and again, so I'm, I'm a big alliterator. But attitude, appetite, and adversity. Um, any specific things that emerged in your group together that you wanted to chat about? Was, it, was this? Yeah, yes. Brian brought up a very interesting point in regarding our appetite for home. Yes. The question was, is it a, an appetite for home or is it no fear of dying? And uh, personally, um, I'd just check out and, and, and go on and be with heaven. I, I think that becomes more and more evident to me as something messes up on my body. And I've got to go to a doctor and get yeah. that fixed, right. like yourself and, and the cheek. So. Yeah, I, I th- it's... He can overcome that. Hebrews 2, it says he's taken away even that fear of death. But it, it would be much better to have an aspiration for a home rather than a fear of death. And then remembering that death is really a second birth canal anyway. Now, it's, it, you know, it's Woody Allen, he put it, it's not that I'm afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> yeah. That's the problem, though. You, it's unavoidable. Unavoidable. It's not necessarily a fear of death. It's just the comfortable to understand it's going to happen. I'm going to go through it. 
Yes. It's not. A, that, that was the point that I made. Oh, yes. yes. I don't want to see, because the other side to that is, of, the, of getting home is, then I don't want to go buy a set of Nike tennis shoes and lay in the train and wait for an asteroid. Those guys wanted to get home, too. Yeah. You know? I, I know what you mean. <laughs> that was a crazy thing. But this is... I, I have a video, uh, and if you would... Um, it's on uh, the website, Cultivating an Appetite for Heaven. For home, I call it heaven in the video, but for home. Here, the five, four things you won't have to deal with and five things you will have. And if you haven't seen that video, I did one of, one of them here, and I did the other one that's that same week on Wednesday morning. There are two versions. I would recommend that you try going through it, and if you're married, do it with your, 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 your spouse. Because I did it with Karen, and I stopped after the world, and, and just talked about after I talked toward that, and then we talked, and then um, I continued about the flesh, the judgment seat of Christ, and then we we, we paused the, the the video, and we talked about it, and that interaction was meaningful, and so I want you to really cultivate this appetite because you are the more you long for home, again, the more heavenly minded you are the more, more earthly good you will do, because you'll see that what you have is this, you only have this day, and this is a precious present, and it'll either be invested or squandered, but you never get it back again. So that mindset of living it with, the, with the end in mind is the key there. So I really would encourage you to ultimately build up that appetite for um, a, 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 a great longing, a great desire for, for more, yeah. What other, any, and then living in, we were talking in our group again, once again, we know we are in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation as it was in Rome. But the, one of the differences, there are certain differences though, and they didn't have the technologies that amplify it in ways that we now have, and mul multiple forms of technology that work in, in a convergence. Even though they are um, independent to some degree, they converge together and create powerful alliances that can be very seductive and overwhelming for many people who can't manage it. So that amplifies uh, evil. You can, but you can use them to amplify good too. But yeah, I, I just wanted to call the attention that uh, one of the things that always amazed me with Paul's life was his attitude to the circumstances that he was in. Uh, you know, it, it would be hard for me to imagine, particularly in his time and place to be in prison and, and be in prison for the greater part of his ministry, it seems like, I'm not sure of the time frame. But for me and, you know, coming along and when you meet people uh, who have uh, a sense of calling of Christ, that they're overwhelmed with the circumstances that they're in and the hope that they have sometimes is kind of put in, in the corner that they don't realize the ultimate goal that they'll be in. Right. That, uh, we're out of time, I'm afraid, but um, it requires the hard thanksgiving of thanking God for a thing you do not like. Not because uh, you want it, but because you know that he has a better good for you than you had. So he will redeem what he allows. So that's really what it comes down to.